Would you grab a hold of the hand of the person or persons that are closest to you right now? I don't know if you sense the greatness of his presence here right now, but if you don't, you need to. You need to. I mean, this isn't planned by me or anyone else. All I have is a normal service plan. But I've always been willing to allow the Holy Spirit to do what He alone knows needs to be done. And as you're holding the hand of that person that next to you right now, and again, I know this is not normal order or service, and that's okay. Amen. If you have a need, be it great in your eyes or even be it small in your eyes, I want you to just take for a moment and, and gently squeeze the hand of, that you're holding. Just as a sign saying, I'm trusting you, Lord, this morning to meet my every need. To meet my every need. I sense the Holy Spirit just moving right now. Can I say to you as we get ready to pray? I've discovered over the last 36 years, nearly 30, 37, that there's not a need that I may have that is insignificant to God. None of them are. I've seen God prove himself and reveal how great he is and, and how much he loves me in some of the, the those simplest of prayers that I've prayed that I thought were just insignificant. But I've seen God literally move mountains out of the way. Orchestrate things that were just beyond my ability to understand just to answer that small, small, insignificant prayer. Just to let me know that he loves me. He hears my every word. He, he sees my every heartfelt desire. And that he's concerned for them as well as I am. And that he's willing and able and does move within the midst of whatever my heartfelt need is. God's getting ready to do something miraculous right here, right now. Don't know what it is. Don't know the magnitude of it. I just know that God's getting ready to be God. <sighs> Father, you saw us as we're holding hands. And you saw the fact that we squeezed the hands of those that we're holding on to out of the midst of a recognition of a need that we have. And Lord, right now, as we sense the wonderment of your presence, and if you're watching online this morning and you sense the same thing, just, just if you're by yourself, just squeeze your own hand, if you will. It's just, it's, it's not anything but an act of faith. It's saying, God, I, I trust you. And without faith, you can't please him. But with faith, mountains are literally moved and cast into the sea. And mountains right now, this morning, are getting ready to be cast into the sea. Right this second. God is in the midst of getting ready to dispatch ministering and warring angels to do whatever that need is. The virtue and the healing virtue of the Holy Spirit is getting ready to move in the midst of whatever that need is. I mean, He's the, he's the one that brings forth healing. That's one of the greatnesses of the gifts that He has for us. Now come into agreement one with another right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, the one who stands at your right hand, ever making intercession for us, the one who saved us by his grace, the one that gave everything that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. In his matchless name this morning, Father, I come into agreement with my brother and with my sister concerning the circumstances that concern them. And Lord, whether it be a great need or a small need, 
Lord, speak to that mountain right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I stand with them and I command that mountain to be cast into the sea right now. And I command liberty to come, break forth into the midst of the need. I command victory, oh God, to come forth into whatever is needed even now. Let healing virtue flow into the midst of your house. Let your glory descend down. Let it dispatch all warring angels to do the battle that needs to be done. Let victory come forth this morning, even now, in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Oh, for that we give you praise. For that we exalt you. For that we magnify your mighty name today. Oh, yes, Lord. Glory. Oh, somebody give him praise in the midst of his sanctuary this morning. Holy, holy, oh, woo. oh, somebody exalt his mighty name. Take a minute, hug somebody's neck, tell them how good looking they are, hallelujah, even if they're not, tell them how good looking they are, because everybody's good looking when you're in God's house, and God's presence is here, amen, hallelujah, oh yes, hug their neck, tell them how good looking, tell everybody to greet them this morning, in Jesus name, bless them, oh, worship with them, yes Lord. God, you're so good, so good, so good. Woo. My, my, my. Oh, holy, 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 holy. holy. Oh, Greet everybody this morning just for a few moments. Tell them how good looking they are. Come on, get up out of your seats and greet somebody this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to do that for a few minutes and then we're going to get ready to praise and worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When the music starts, get ready to worship. Amen. God's good. Hallelujah. There he is. God bless. Good morning, everybody. I guess so. Let's get ready. Good morning, sis. How you doing? Good. Praise the Lord. Let's get ready to worship the Lord. Amen.
back again. I know you will all the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. You took, you take our sins away, oh God. You
to be able to receive right now is an act of faith saying Lord I need your touch right now because it's more than able more than willing oh yes Lord yes Lord Father right now Lord you know this family but Joe standing in the women's stuff standing in the gap for right now let your peace overtake them let your joy flood your soul, even though, oh God, this is a time of bereavement. Lord, let your glory break forth in such a measure that God, you be glorified. And Lord, for those that are standing this morning, every person, whatever that thing is that's in your life that may be hindering you, if there is such a thing, whatever might be going on in your life that you need God to heal you of, in the midst of, bring healing into your physical body, be it physical or spiritual. If you're online and you're watching, whatever that need is right now, the power of God is flowing. Chains of bondage are being broken even now. Break every chain. Break every chain. Just start to praise Him for it. Now, you may not sense it as of this moment, 
But you standing is an act of faith saying, God, I'm trusting you. It's an act of faith, it's faith saying, Lord, I believe you for my need right now. And it might seem like a, a mountain that's looming before you that's impossible to cross over. You can't cross over it yourself. But I know someone who can. I know someone who's more than able this morning. Amen. I know somebody that can break the chains of bondage off of the life of that one that maybe you're standing in the gap for if it's not yourself. I know the power of healing that can take place right now if you're standing for that need. If you're standing around somebody that's standing right now, if you're or sitting around somebody that's standing that has a need, I want you to just uh, reach out to them. I want you to lay hands upon them. Stand with them. Stand in the gap, if you will, with them right this very minute. God has done the miraculous already in our midst today. He's in the midst of doing more, even this very moment. Things that only He can do. Again, if you're watching online, just stretch your hand this way. Let the Holy Spirit just minister into your life. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus. Once again, that matchless name that is above every name. The name in which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess his Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our King, our Lord, the one who is coming when the trump sounds. Lord, in your name right now, let your glory just glorify you. Touch every heart and touch every life. Break every bondage, oh Lord, right now. Set every captive free in Jesus' name. Oh, just start to praise Him for it. Just start to praise Him for receiving it. Just start to exalt His name because He's in the midst of breaking every chain, every bondage, doing that which only He can do right now. Break every power in the name of Jesus. Oh, sing it to Him. There is power a shout of victory in the house this morning. Woo! Glory! Somebody say amen. amen. God's good. All the time. Woo! Glory be to God. Amen, amen, and amen. God's good. All the time. Ha ha! Anybody blessed this morning? Amen. Glory to God. Woo! Don't you love it when the Lord decides to show up as only He can, doing that which only He's able to? Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We've got a couple of announcements we do need to get out of the way. Sister Lucinda, I saw you wrote your name down there. <laughs> I did. That's because you didn't get a chance to last week. You skipped me last Somebody week. messed up on you last week, didn't they? We won't We're not name saying names. we won't name names, but by, by the way, go ahead. 
Um, so just a quick reminder, the youth group has their big fundraiser coming up on May 13th. Um, I did change the times a little bit because I forgot that the ladies' banquet was that night also. So it is now from 9 to 3 instead of 9 to 4, um, but they're taking pledges. Our goal is to wash 100 cars. Um, if you pledge 10 cents a car, that's $10 if we hit our goal. But if 20 people pledge that, that covers one kid's camp. And actually a little additional for the summer. Um, so How please, many kids we got going to camp? Right now my count is 10. 10. 10 kids. And, and what's the cost per kid? 150. That's 150. the early bird special. Okay. Um, so, so we got $1,500 worth of expense, to, yes. at least. Yes. So Think about that. If you haven't pledged yet, or if you want to pledge multiple kids, they're all hanging out right over there. Please get with Raise them. Raise your hands, kids. Um, or get with me. Oh, come on. Wait, you raise your hands, all of you. You can do better than that. Woo! Bunch of wimps. All right, so the Bunch ones that wimps. are raising their hands want to go to camp. <laughs> um, also, um, uh, if, if any adults would love to volunteer their time and come and help me on May 13th, like corral and organize and wash some cars, that would really be appreciated. Amen. Um, if you don't, can't do it all day, that's cool. Um, you know, just a couple hours. It really honestly would very much be appreciated. We're going to be advanced auto in Tarpon um, from 9 to 3. Amen. So get with me and let me know. Thank you. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. Amen. Amen. You going? Okay. okay we'll see you later. Amen. Thank you, Brother Joe. Good to have you with us this morning. Amen. Always love the sound of the, of the trumpet. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. Worthy of praise. So make sure you see all the kids. Um, if you want to just, you know, donate and give money to the cause, that would be a great thing also. Want to fill up the, uh, the, the coffers of the, the youth ministry. Getting ready to do some great things that are getting ready to start to take place. So we want to go ahead and, and be a blessing to them. Amen? Amen. And uh, make sure you come out and get your car washed also on that day. Hallelujah. It'll be a great time. Also, if you're not aware of it, um, we have Mother's Day coming out. How many know Mother's Day is just a little, just around the corner? It's in two, two Sundays. Two Sundays from today. And we're going to be celebrating that, but just the day before that, on the 13th, the ladies um, are having their banquet, and they're going to have a great event they have, you know, planned and all. Um, the food itself, ladies, is all going to be catered by Carabas. They're going to be bringing in uh, out there in the front, there's all kinds of sign-up sheets that you need to sign up for it. Uh, the cost is only $10. That's a, a full meal. I mean, there's three entrees that you can pick from. Just pick one. Uh, you got salads. You've got desserts. You've got uh, appetizers. You've got all kinds of things going on in the midst of it, including beverage. And you can't beat that for $10. Trust me. You can go out. If you went to Carabas, they, they, they spent that kind of money with dessert and everything and appetizers, you spend about $25, $30. And so you'll be blessed by that. Uh, they're, so they're doing, you know, doing that. But it needs to be, you need to sign up between now and now. In next Sunday, Sunday the seventh is the last day. It's being cut off that day. Uh, your monies need to be in also. Then see Sister Betty, I guess, with the money, and Sister Betty, Betty and Betty, Amen. And make sure that that all gets in there uh, to do that. I need about six to eight men that are going to volunteer for that day. We will feed you that day. You're going to be blessed in the midst of it also. But see me concerning that so that you uh, can help with clean up and set up and and so on and so forth. And, and if you don't show up, you know you're going to have to answer to my wife. I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Hello. She'll take it out on me. You know what I'm saying? And, and you, you'd hate to see me cry, wouldn't you? No. Oh, no. I'm going home right now. That's it. I'm going home. I'm out of here. But seriously, sign up out there in the front. Uh, we need to get a count. Uh, so that I can get everything situated and going. And again, Krabba is going to be catering it, bringing it in here. And it's going to be a, a great time. And uh, I'm looking forward to it so that I can help serve you ladies and be a blessing and all that. Because Mother's Day is a very special time. Amen. And, and in the midst of it, we become a blessing to not only them. Because they've blessed us in so many different ways. Uh, so, you know, pray about that. And ask God what he would have you to do in the midst as far as being out here. Uh, ladies, as far as coming out, being part of that. Men serving and so on and so forth. Um, I think that covers anybody else got anything? We're all good? Everybody good? All right. Let's get ready to give to the Lord this morning. Amen. Uh, if you're online, you know there's an online giving button there that you can just sort of press that and give and spell million, M-I-L-L-I-O-N. And, um, you know, it's all good. Amen. Uh, but in the midst of giving today, you know, I, I think about the book of Deuteronomy, the 15th chapter, verse number 10. And it says this. It says, give generously. 
and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because you did that, give generously without a begrudging heart. Because of this, as scriptures say, the Lord himself will bless you in all your work and in everything that you put your hand to. What a blessing that is, amen? What a powerful thing when you stop and consider that God, because we have a heart to give to the work of his kingdom, will bless us many, many ways over. So as you prepare your heart to give, realize that God commands us to, and he does. He commands us to give because that's how he supports the work of his kingdom. But more importantly, God wants you to give so that he'll bless the rest in a measure that goes beyond measure. So allow God to bless you today as you give to the work of his kingdom. Amen? Lift up your tithes and your offerings before the Lord this morning. This morning, Father, we give you praise and we magnify your name. And we rejoice in you evermore because you are the giver. The giver of life, the giver of all matters and all things. And Lord, this morning as we give to the work of your kingdom, I ask God that you would bless not only the gift, bless the giver, glorify yourself in it all. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Give to the Lord this morning, church. Is there anybody blessed in the house this morning? Let me say that again. Is anybody blessed in the house? <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo, did you sense his sweet presence here today? Amen. God's good. God's good. God's good. I don't know if I mentioned it. Of course, the cost of the, uh, the banquet is, yeah, yes, I did. It's only $10. Uh, you'll be blessed by that because I tell you what, when you see what's on the menu out there in the front and you realize what uh, you're going to be able to partake of that and, and you know, I'm sure we'll probably even have a little extra left over in the midst of it for the guys, you know what I'm saying? You guys I'm sure can have more than just a little, maybe, maybe not, but in the midst of it all, you will be blessed, amen, as you allow God to minister through us as we celebrate Mother's Day this year. I want to um, continue on with a thought process that I started uh, last week about living the victor's life. I believe God wants us to live victoriously in everything that goes on in our lives. Even in the midst of trying times and tragedies and circumstances that try to overtake us, I believe God has nothing but victory in store for us. We discovered that last week as we sort of take, took a look a little bit at, at, at uh, David's life a little bit and the circumstances that he faced. And, and we took a look at some different things in life itself and talked about turning tragedy into triumph. And that's what we took a look at in David's life as we explored some things that happened to him as he was coming back from a battle or was getting ready to try to go into a battle. And he came back and everything that he owned... His family was taken, everything they owned was bur basically burnt to the ground, and, and not only him, but everybody that was with him. 
Things were so bad, as we, we shared last week, that God, was not God, but the, the men that were with him were literally looking to kill David and destroy him. That's how bad things were. But the scriptures talk very clearly about the reality of what David chose to do in the midst of his circumstances. How about, about the reality of living the victor's life, if you will, and in the midst of it, transforming and changing everything around. Because what does scripture say in 1 Samuel 30 and 6? It says that, that David encouraged himself in the Lord. In other words, in the midst of all that was going on, no matter how bad things seemed to be, and, and, and trust me, things were probably worse for him than it's ever been for you or me. In the midst of it, he said he encouraged himself in the Lord. In other words, he started praising God no matter what was transpiring. I think in the midst of what was happening in his circumstances, in the midst of facing this tragedy, that he was also turning around and started thinking about how good God had been to him over the years. How God had transformed his situations around. How God had moved in the midst of all kinds of circumstances. And he held on to that hope in his heart and his life, knowing full and well that God was getting ready to do something great, even though it seemed like God was nowhere around. Have you ever been in that place in your walk with God, that it seemed like God was nowhere around, that he didn't care about what was happening, you've been crying out and crying out and crying out, and God is not answering? It's like you're sounding brass, you know what I mean? You're talking to a brass wall, so to speak, and God was nowhere around. Have you ever been there before? Well, that's the kind of situation that David faced. And so we talked about that simple point of turning tragedy into triumph. Because you see, what you and I need to know about life is that God wants you to live the victor's life. He wants you to be victorious all the time. So this morning, I want to sort of continue on with some of the thought. I want to look in the book of Jonah, the first chapter, verse 3. Just pull out one out of the story. How many of you are familiar with the story of Jonah? It's a story of great tragedy, so to speak, in some respects. But it's also a story of great triumph in other respects. But it's also a story, and that's what we're going to be talking about, about being, becoming a victim and turning that into becoming a victor in life itself. But in the book of Jonah, in the first chapter, verse 3, it said, But Jonah got up and he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Have you ever gotten to that place in your walk with God that you started going in the wrong direction? Can I see a show of hands this morning? I really want to see your hands. How about the rest of you? I mean, in all of our lives, we do face things sometimes, and, and we don't realize that we are going in the opposite direction of God only until after we've gone. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you think you're going in the direction that God's going in, and all of a sudden you discover that you're 25 miles away from Him, so to speak, in the midst, because circumstances are happening, and you don't understand why. But that's sort of what happened to Jonah, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But he, he got up, and, and he went in the opposite direction. But he did it with a purpose, because he wanted to get away from God. Now, it's one thing to go in the opposite direction of God, you know, not being aware that you are. But it's another thing to purposely go in the dire opposite direction of God. And that's sort of what happened to Jonah. And, and so I guess what we need to do is ask ourselves the question, well, why? And we need to take a look at that this morning as we talk about the reality of becoming the victor that God wants to be. So I want to ask you this question. Am I a victim or am I a victor? In other words, have I become a victim in the midst of all that's going on in my life? Or am I turning that circumstance into a place of victory? And in that victory, I'm being, you know, overcoming every circumstance that I'm facing. It's an important question that you need to ask for yourself and you need to answer in the midst of everything that's going on around about you. Because you are either a victim or you are a victor in everything you face in life. Everything. And, and God, as I said earlier, God wants you to live a victorious life. He wants you to be a victor in everything that's going on in life. I mean, you might say, well, how do I know that that's what God wants? Well, I, I can tell you this morning that you can recognize it when you start to take a look at the Scriptures. And let me just briefly talk of just about a few. I, I want to talk about the reality of, of being victorious for a few moments before I talk a little bit about Jonah. 
I want you to realize this morning that God's greatest desire is that you be victorious in everything that you face in life because being a, a victim or being a victor is the key, to, the key to life itself and you only become a victim when you realize that even though you may be victimized, you can be victorious no matter what's going on in life. And you can become that way because you learn to trust God and turn everything over into God's hand. How do I know it? Revelation 2, 7. Let's go on a journey just for a few minutes. He, the Lord said this in speaking to you and me in the midst of things. When he's talking to the church, he says, to everyone who is victorious. This is Jesus talking. He says, I will give you fruit from the very tree of life and the paradise of God. He's saying to you and I that if you choose to live a victorious life, God is going to feed you from the very tree of life itself. He's going to glorify himself in your heart and life. Why? Because you You've chosen to stand on him no matter what's going on in life and revelation 2 11 he talks about whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death in other words he's saying to you and i listen if you persevere and you make it through whatever it is that you're going through and you're trusting me in the midst because can i say the only way you'll ever be victorious in life is if you're trusting him They'll have no victory any other way. Oh, you might be able to pull up your bootstraps, so to speak, in the midst of life. And you might be able to persevere. You might be able to be good in business and do all manner and sort of thing. But I can tell you this one thing in life itself. One day you're going to face a circumstance that you can't overcome. And you realize that there is an overcomer. And that he's the one that you've got to trust. And whoever is victorious, in other words, has their trust in him. Oh, not even the second death itself will be able to overtake your heart and your life. Why? Because you're trusting God all the more. In Revelation 2.17, he said, To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. Oh, can I tell you that God has things he wants to feed you today that you have no knowledge of, that only God can feed you. But when you want to be victorious, God will feed you from the very tree of life. He'll feed you from the abundance of his goodness. And you will be victorious in everything you do. Why? Because you're feeding from God's table. He said, I'll give each one of them a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no other one understands except the one who receives it. In other words, God is going to reveal to you great mysteries of life itself. Why? Because you wanted to, you've chosen to trust him. I want to stop and talk about Jonah just for a second. In the midst of things, there was a place and a point in Jonah's life that he became a victim. He became a victim. Why? Because he chose to walk opposite to where God wanted him to. You can do that in life, and that'll happen. But all of a sudden, because of his circumstances. If you know the circumstance, you know what I'm talking about. But because of the place that God put him in, where he had no choice but to all of a sudden look up, his life became victorious. Why? Because he did a few things, and we're going to talk about that. But here's the point that I want you to understand in the midst of this Revelation 2.17 is a simple truth that because you trust God, because you choose to engulf your heart and your life into the midst of what God is, no matter what it is that you're facing, God himself will help you to be victorious and he'll give you from the very bread of his own table, so to speak. You'll feed off of that. He'll transform your life. He'll change your name. He'll do whatever needs to be done so that in the midst of things you are victorious amen god wants you to live that way in revelation 2 26 through 28 he says to all who are victorious who obey, obey me to the very very end oh church can i tell you a victorious life is someone who chooses to obey god to the very end no matter what is going on to them i will give authority over all the nations i'm here to tell you today that if you choose to trust god if you choose to serve god if you choose to give your life to the lord no matter what's going on you surrender everything god is going to make you kings and priests in the midst of his kingdom you're going to rule and you're going to reign with him it doesn't matter what satan may be saying god will make you victorious no matter what goes on you're going to rule over the nations. Why? Because you chose to trust God in the midst of what's going on. You can't do it yourself, but you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. They will have the same authority. Think about that. Because you chose to live victoriously trusting God even in the midst of tragedy. God will give you the same authority that, that he received from God the Father. Jesus said, you'll have that very same authority. And he'll give it to the morning star. In other words, in the midst of life itself, God's going to let you shine in the midst of whatever's going on. Why? Because you've chosen to trust him no matter what is going on. 
Revelation 3.5, he said, all who are victorious will be clothed in white. Can I tell you what a marching song that is when you and I realize that God is going to give you victory no matter what's happening in your life and he's going to wash away your sins, cast them as far as these is from west never to be remembered again and he's going to clothe you in white. You don't deserve to be but because of who he is, he's going to do it. Amen? And he says, I'll never erase your name out of the book of life itself. I'm here to tell you it's an indelible ink. It's when his blood and because of what he's done, you're going to have victory. Oh, he'll proclaim you before the Father and before his angels. And he'll say that you are his. Why? Because your trust is in him. Your victory is only found in him. Oh, he says those who trust him, by, he will by no means cast you out. Why? Because he loves you with a love that goes beyond your understanding. In Revelation 3.12, he says, All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. Can I tell you that when you trust God, you stand steadfast no matter what's happening in the midst of it. The wind may blow and the things may sway and they may try to get you to topple over, but you'll stand like a pillar in the temple of God himself. And oh my goodness gracious, because you've trusted God, God will see to it that you never have to leave the presence of the Most High God. And and he said, he'll write your name in his book and in the midst of all that, that you'll be a citizen in the city of, his God, of, of our God. What am I saying to you and I? That when you and I trust God, God moves in the midst. And those who are victorious, he said, they'll sit with him on his throne. What am I saying, church? I'm saying that in life itself, you have a choice whether to be a victim or to become a victor. You have a choice to either wallow in the midst of what you're going through and allow the enemy to defeat you, or you can realize in the midst of things in life itself, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Greater is he who is inside of me than the enemy who is in this world. In other words, I can trust God no matter what is going on, even if it seems like I'm going down for the third time. I'm mindful just for the moment about Jeremiah, and I'm thinking about the reality. Jeremiah served God with every faithfulness that he had in his life himself. He was called the weeping prophet. Why? Because his life seemed to be a tragedy. It seemed like he was a victim all the time. But even when in the midst of Scripture says that he was down in the midst of a pit and it seemed like he could never get out of it. He was stuck in the mire. Things weren't going to change. He was going to die down in this pit. All of a sudden God sent somebody by the name of Ebed Melech down his way and he put down a rope and brought him on out. I'm here to tell you that word Ebed Melech. The name means the servant of the Most High God. What I'm here to tell you today, God has always got somebody that he'll send your way that take you out in the midst of things. And you will be victorious no matter what's going on. If you trust God no matter what's going on. Oh, somebody give him praise in this house. And you're going to sit down with the Father at his throne. Oh, somebody praise him. In Revelation 15, he says, And all the people who had victory over the beast. Listen, if you have victory over the beast, that's what's going to make you victorious. He says they were all holding harps that God had given to them. Oh, and they were singing the song of Moses. Oh, and the song of the Lamb. I'm here to tell you. So, glory to God. Victory. Victory! I said victory is yours if you trust the Lord today. In Revelation 21 and 7, he says, All who are victorious, ha, they will inherit every blessing that God says is yours. Oh, from cover to cover, inside to out. There are blessings here that are for every single one of us. If you choose, in other words, to trust God. When you learn to trust God in the midst of all that's going on, even if it seems like you're going down for the third time, and you still lift your hands and say, God, even if I draw my last breath, even if I'm like Job, so to speak, that, oh, in the midst I'm lost everything. Though you slay me, though you slay me, though you slay me, yet am I going to praise you. Oh, when you praise God, I don't care if you do die. You're still victorious. He said you'll inherit all the blessings. 
And he said, he'll be your God. But more importantly, you'll be his child. I'm here to tell you this morning, there's a reality of life that we all face in life that is contingent upon what we choose to do with life. See, Jonah became a victim because he was self-centered and he lived his life deceived. I want you to think about that just for a second because maybe the Lord's speaking to you this morning. Because we're all Jonah's in certain respects, in certain ways, every one of us. You could have a Jonah moment today. Even while you're shouting, you can start to go down the you know, a situation where a Jonah moment is going to happen in your life. His problems stem from the reality that his life was just a little bit off kilter, if you will. His heart was self-centered. You see it throughout the scriptures in the midst of reading the story. In verse 3 that I read, but Jonah, he says he got up and he went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Anybody that wants to get away from the Lord wants to do things their own way, have things their own way. Trust me, you're self-centered. Period. End of sentence. Because the moment that God is not on your throne, then you are. And, and believe it or not, really you're not on it either. Satan is. Hello, are you hearing me this morning? And when, you, when, when all that matters to you is you, the only one that has a problem is you. That's the truth. Now some of you are laughing, and I know where you are because you've discovered this. Hello? But some of you haven't discovered it yet. But because God loves you, you will. You'll discover it eventually, one day. It's going to happen to you. I can guarantee it. Why? Because God loves you. You see, God speaking to Jonah and telling Jonah to go to Nineveh and proclaim that judgment was coming upon the people there wasn't by accident. God could have picked any one of his prophets. I don't know if you ever thought about that before. But he could have picked any one of his prophets to go to Nineveh and make that proclamation. But instead he chose Jonah. Now the reason he chose Jonah, and this you really need to understand, is because he knew that Jonah was self-centered. And he knew that Jonah was deceived. And he wanted to deliver Jonah out of the midst of being a victim. He wanted him, him to become a victor in life. He wanted him to live a victorious life. He wanted him to reap the benefit of all that we just talked about in Revelation. He wants you to also. But you see, Jonah had become a victim because of what was going on inside of his heart. And so God chose Jonah to be the one to go down there because he knew that hidden deep inside of Jonah's heart, just as he knows everything that's hidden deep inside of your heart. Hello. He knows everything that's in the hidden recesses of your heart. He knows everything that only you talk to yourself about. He knows everything that the enemy whispers into your thought process and into your heart and your life that, 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 that you are starting to lean towards. He knows everything. He knows it all. And he knew that in Jonah's heart that Jonah had a hatred inside of him towards the people that lived in Nineveh. He knew it. He knew the bitterness and the strife that dwelt on the inside of him. And here Jonah was a prophet of God. I need you to hold on to that thought. You see, he was a prophet of God. But in the midst of it, he had things going on inside of him that he shouldn't. And part of the reason probably is that pride got in the way. I'm a prophet of God, so watch out. You know? I, I, I'm, trust me. Listen, God wouldn't have called me if I wasn't perfect. 
<laughs> it's, it's, the, <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's just the one eater. Amen. <laughs> the, but the reality, you understand what I'm talking about? You know, we can, we be, we can become so self-deceived if we're not careful in life. We start looking at our accomplishments and we start... <laughs> I know none of you do this. I know it. But the reality of it is, is all you, you, what you fail to see is that you're setting yourself up for a great fall. But see, the enemy knows that. But so does God. And, and God knew <clears throat> where Jonah was going. God knew what was in his heart. And what God wanted to do was to deliver Jonah from what was in his heart. That he, Jonah himself, didn't even realize was there. You know, Jonah, even though he had hatred inside of his heart, <clears throat> and even though he had bitterness and strife towards the people that lived there, he just didn't really see it. Because he lived it. He lived in it. Have you ever been to that place in your life where your, your thought process of being bombarded with all kinds of trash and junk, and it becomes familiar to you. All of a sudden, so-and-so walks by, and your mind starts, shh, you know. Don't look at me, sanctimonious. <laughs> it's the truth. You see, what's happening there is that God, on one hand, is trying to help you to see what he sees. And then, on the other hand, the enemy is just trying to feed it. All that much more. So he, Satan wants to keep you as a victim, but God wants you to be a victor. And the only way you become a victor is that you start to recognize and see yourself how God sees you. So in the midst of what was transpiring with Jonah, he had to go through these situations. He had to get in the midst of the belly of that fish. He had to finally come to a realization, see himself face to face, if you will. And that's why he was in the midst of a situation and a, and a thing that wasn't good for him or anybody else. He, he was living in a tragedy that God wanted to turn into a triumph. But it would never turn into a triumph until he finally came face to face with the tragedy and realized that the tragedy wasn't the circumstance, but the tragedy was him. Hello. Until you realize that your own, you are your own worst enemy, things aren't going to change. I mean, I can, I can try to help you all the way down the road, and I, I do at times. But the reality of it is, you've got to help yourself. You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to help you. Because I've realized that I can't do a thing for you. But God in three seconds can transform everything. So we've got to get out of the way and let God become the way. Hello. But let me move on. I'm out of time. I understand this. But bear with me just for a few moments. See, Jonah allowed his past to drive him into an uncertain in an unwanted future. You and I, when God's trying to reveal things to us and speak into our hearts and lives, because God tried to talk to Jonah, you know. Before he sent him on this journey to Nineveh, trust me, God tried to talk to him. God's always trying to talk to us. He's always trying to help us to recognize and understand what he sees that we reject and refuse to receive. Good preaching, Pastor. Because the reality of life boils down to this. He loves us so much that he is going to try to talk to us. And we turn around, especially when it comes to God's word. I mean, if God's saying, listen, you shouldn't be going down this road because it's contrary to what I want and say. And then all of a sudden, the thoughts are entering your heart and your mind that, oh, God loves me. And, and I know the Lord and everything's okay. And, and he doesn't, it doesn't bother him that I'm walking contrary. God, bless, he just loves me. You're deceived. The enemy's driving you to an uncertain and, un, and an unwanted future, and you think it's all okay. Why? Because, well, I think it. See, that's the, first, that's the problem. If you think that you're okay, when God's Word says you're not, 
and you've got a thousand excuses telling you that you are, guess what? You're headed for a fish. You're headed for a fish. God will see to it, not because he's upset with you, but because he loves you. He does not want you to face the uncertain and unwanted future that he knows you're going to face. And he's trying to deliver you out of it. He'll do everything he can, but you can get to that place that the fish will not only swallow you, but I'll have you for lunch if you're not careful. You can't go too far. I'm trying to finish. Joseph be, uh, Jonah became a victor when he did these very three things, and I'm going to talk to you very quickly about them. He stopped making excuses to God. He stopped making excuses. I mean, you think about it. In Jonah 1, 12, he says, I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. And all of a sudden, I mean, things were just, oh, things were just upside down. He was carrying on in the midst of some things, turned around, and, and when they, the people on the boat started questioning him about the reality of, well, who are you, and, and what is it that you're doing, and so on and so forth, uh, Jonah's answer to them was simply this, talking about thinking he was all all right because he was a prophet of God, and so on and so forth. He, he said in, in verse number nine, he says, he says, listen, you guys, quit pointing fingers at me. He says, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord. Can I tell you, you can worship God all day long and still die and go to hell? It's a fact. Don't believe me? Satan worshiped God, Lucifer. Anybody know where he's heading up? It was created for him and for everyone that chooses to not serve God. I'm, I'm, I know what time it is. Oh, I have plenty of time. It's only 12. No. But the reality of it boiled down to is, is that he became a victor when he stopped making excuses for his ways. And he realized that God is the way, and he had only one way, and he needed to trust God in the midst of it, and he needed to surrender his heart and his life, and he needed to get things turned around. Second thing that he did is that he became a victim when he turned back towards God. Listen, God is always speaking to us about the reality of who he is and what he wants for our hearts and lives. He's always showing us the way. Why? Because he is the way. Amen. And in the midst of showing that to you and I, we have got to come to a place of either going down the road we're going, which is contrary to what God says, or finally we put the brakes on and we stop and we turn back towards God. It's one or the other. There is no in between. But Jonah made that choice. He said, I cried out in verse 2, 2, 2, 2. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble. And he answered me. But it only happened when he was finally in down in the belly of the fish. Do you really want to let your life get down into the belly of the fish? Can you think about it just for a second, what was down in the middle of that belly? Have you ever thought about it? <laughs> Do you want to come up here, Brother James, and tell everybody? No, I mean, seriously, it's, it, you know, it's, it stinks at the very best. But that's what he was living in. Do you realize that when you're walking contrary to what God would have for you in life, you're living in, in stench? Not only living in it, you actually are the stench. Now, don't get upset with me, but that's a fact. I'm only saying that to you because what God wants to do is deliver you out of the stench. He wanted to deliver out Jonah out of it. He wanted to speak to that fish and say, okay, it's time to let the boy go. But it didn't happen until Jonah all of a sudden realized that he was wrong. He stopped making excuses before God concerning things. And he turned back to God saying, God, forgive me. He cried out, it says, to the Lord in the midst of his trouble. And the great part about that statement is this. It's not the fact that he cried out to the Lord, but it says this, and he, meaning God, answered Jonah. You know, God, you'll never hear an answer from God until you get to the place where you finally face to face with God and you bowed before God. You surrendered. Last thing I want to say to you is this. Well, almost the last. Jonah became a victor when, when he finally submitted his life to God. 
doesn't happen any other way. Until you finally surrender and submit to God, you, like they have said, think you're sitting on the throne. You think you're in charge. And you're never meant to be in charge. Never. Never. There's only one who's supposed to be in charge and on the throne of your life. That's the one who paid the price. Now, if you're able to pay the price, then get on the throne. But there's nobody able to. In verse 3.3, 3, he said this. It says, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command, and then he went to Nineveh. When you finally submit to what God has been trying to speak to you in life, that's when everything changes for the better. And it never will change until you do that. Hear me if you hear nothing else. God can hold his breath longer than you can. Understand what I'm saying to you? God can hold his breath longer than you can. Don't try, I have. <laughs> but that's the reality of life. So you see, victory becomes yours when that happens. So the real question in life is this, you know, how Jonah chose to handle the things that were in his life determined where he was going to spend his tomorrow. Do you realize the same, same thing applies to you? Where you spend your tomorrow is all dependent on how you choose to handle what God puts before you today. Choose life or choose death. It's your choice. Choose what God wants, which is life, or choose what you want, which is death. It's a no-brainer. Even I can figure it out. I mean, that's the reality of life. I I'm trying to close. Am I a victim or am I a victor? See, how you handle today determines where you will be tomorrow. A victim is bound by his choices, while a victor is set free by his choices. It's a fact. We are all either a victim to or a victor over our past. And if I'm a victim, then I am a prisoner. I am. So I just want to give you an illustration in closing out the thought with a statement. And it's simply this. Whether you stay a victim or a victor in life, your life, has everything to do with how you see things. And how you see things has everything to do with what you set your sights on. And what you set your sights on will literally be the direction you go in and will be the area or the way of life that you yield to. And who you yield to rules over you. And who rules over you determines the outcome of your future. And your future is is determined by what you set your sights on. I want you to go home with a small illustration today that I'd like you to do. I want to pick this thought process up next Sunday, all right, because I want to be continuing on with this thought process of living the victor's life. And I want to have a message that is basically entitled, uh, just to give you a preemptive on it, you, you save it and you'll lose it. Lose it and you'll save it. Life is really all boils down to that very statement. And I'll explain more. But when you go home today, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look over at a wall or an object, whatever it might be. And I want you to keep focus on it because know this about your life. God gave you one set of eyes, two eyes. And there for a purpose... 
beyond you to be able to see. They're there for you to look in a certain direction. You realize that? It's a fact. All right? And if God wanted you to look in a different direction other than the way that he gave you one set of eyes to look forward in, he would have put another set in the back of your head. But he didn't. Moms have that. I understand that. Yeah. My mom did. I don't know how she did, but she did. You know, oh, I'm telling you, you know, we, don't, we don't want to go there. But, <laughs> but you're messing up my illustration. I, you know. But uh, uh, the, here's the point. Real simple. Go home today. Make sure you have somebody else around you that can protect you. And I want you to get your eyes fixed on something. And then I want you to do one thing. Start walking backwards. And let me know what the outcome of that walk is. Okay? If you can just keep walking. Don't stop. Don't just don't walk and look, don't do that. Keep your eyes set and just keep walking. And let me know what the outcome is. And the point is simple. Real point. This applies to what you look at and what you think on. What you dwell on, you will dwell in. What you look at, you will go to. That's life. Now, I'll elaborate on it more next week, but the point is simple as you stand. Are you a victim or are you a victor? Do you realize that it's your choice? Isn't that great about God? You can choose to be a victim or you can choose to be a victor. You'll always be a victim until you choose to walk the way God would have you to. When it's all about you, you'll always be a victim. When your life becomes all about Him, you will become a victor. And that's what He wants. Grab a hold of the hand that's next to you. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for the sweetness of your presence that has shown up here in a powerful way. I thank you for how you've ministered to the hearts and lives of your children in a very special way today, revealing yourself as you have. I thank you, Lord, for your word that you're speaking into each one of our lives today, helping us to recognize that we have a choice in life to be either a victim, we all are at times, or to become a victor which is the very essence of what you want us to be able to live our lives by. Not by our standard, because some people think they're victors, Lord, when they really and truly aren't, because they're living underneath their standard, and that's a false standard of life. So, Lord, today, help us to recognize in our own lives, as you looked at Jonah, look at ours, and help us to see and reveal to us the areas that we are a victim in, where we've been deceived by the enemy, where we need to become victorious in. And then, Lord, even though we may not want to, Lord, if we need to, first try to speak to us. Hopefully we'll listen. But if we won't, Lord, put us in that belly of that fish. Change us, transform us. So that, Lord, we can not only live victoriously as you would want us to be but as revelation 21 7 says all who are victorious they will inherit all of your blessings and you will be our god and we will be your children lord that's our goal so fulfill it lord inside of us this day in jesus mighty name and amen give the lord an offering of praise this morning Thanks for coming out and being with us today. May the Lord bless you. Get up tomorrow morning and ask yourself that question. Am I a victim or a victor?